what you're doing every day with this patient in front of you, this, this vulnerable person that's come to you, it's a privilege. You know, this is this honor that society has given us that allows us to take care of that person. Welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. I'm Dr. Jen Barna, and I am so appreciative that you have joined us today for this conversation with a physician who I admire and has just published a book that I highly recommend, Dr. David Alfrey. Dr. Alfrey was raised in the North, but moved to Louisiana to attend Tulane University, where he graduated with a BA degree in English. And after graduating from LSU Medical School in New Orleans, he spent a year as a surgical intern at the University of Kentucky, and then did his residency in anesthesia at the University of California in San Diego. He stayed there for an additional year of fellowship training in cardiothoracic anesthesia, and then moved on to Nashville, Tennessee, where he spent a 36-year career in private practice. He has served as the chief of anesthesia, president of the Tennessee State of Anesthesiologists, and was founding member of the Anesthesia Medical Group, one of the largest anesthesia practices in the United States. For 20 years, he served as an oral examiner for the American Board of Anesthesiology, ending his tenure as a senior examiner. He holds an academic appointment at Vanderbilt University Medical Center as adjunct associate professor of anesthesiology. And while in practice, he participated in numerous medical missions with Operation Smile. Dr. Alfrey has authored 10 chapters in medical textbooks and 41 peer-reviewed articles in anesthesia medical journals. He's invented several anesthesia devices that are sold worldwide and for which he has been awarded 17 U.S. and international patents. He's been married to his medical school sweetheart, Joyce, for over 45 years and together they have three daughters and five and counting granddaughters. Dr. David Alfrey has authored a book that has just been published called Saving Grace, What Patients Teach Their Doctors About Life, Death, and the Balance in Between. And we're thrilled to have him here today on Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. Dr. David Alfrey, welcome to Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast. It's Terrific to talk with you. I'm thrilled to to discuss your new book with you, Saving Grace. And this has just come out in January 2023. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on. Well, you and I have been having a conversation uh, for a couple of months leading up to this, and I'm very interested in hearing your personal experience as a writer with this book, I was touched by the stories that you tell. And I highly recommend the book to any physician who I think would relate personally to the stories in the book, as well as any pre-med or medical student. There are a lot of questions that I have for you. And I, I suppose the first one is what inspired you to write this book? Why these stories? Well, if, you know, I had a 36 year career as a cardiac anesthesiologist and it was a great career. I was just so blessed and I finished it and I had all of these stories, you know, bouncing around in my head. And I think all physicians have these amazing things that happened in their career. And for some reason, I just had a desire to tell them. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll talk about what we do in the profession of anesthesia. And I looked around to see what had been written. And I found that almost nothing had been written, which was, I mean, it was amazing because the, the, the discovery of general anesthesia in 1847 is considered by many the most significant advance in medicine in the history of like ever. And nobody's written about life in the OR and the ICU from our perspective. So it started with that. And um, as I wrote it, I was writing these stories about things that had happened and how we do them and so forth. And I realized that the stories all sort of had a, a, a lesson to teach or a sort of a moral to each story. And so that's how I came up with the, the subtitle, what uh, patients teach their doctors about 
life, death, and the balance in between. Because I, I realized that over 36 years, I'd learned so much, but if it hadn't been for the patients, I'd never learned it. Yes, and I want to say, uh, before we get too far into the conversation, that we will link to the book in our show notes, Saving Grace, What Patients Teach Their Doctors About Life, Death, and the Balance in Between. So if you're listening and you're interested in finding the book, you can easily access it there. And one thing that I noticed when I was reading the book is how beautifully vulnerable you are willing to be. And that I think when you say that no one has written these stories or these types of stories before from your perspective, in a way, I'm not surprised because as physicians, it seems like we have some barriers to allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And you overcame that barrier in writing this book, starting with when you began medical school. And I am I would love to know about how difficult it may have been to overcome that barrier, or if that's something that always came naturally to you. I think it was a little difficult. And, and um, I, I think the ability to overcome that barrier and to sort of strip your soul bare, if you will, uh, I think that becomes easier as you get older. And when you get late in life, you realize, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of point in being fake or putting on a show. There's not a lot of time left. So um, be as real as you can be. And as I wrote the stories, um, I decided that I, I just had to make them the way they really happened. And some of the stories are really painful. And even now, when I, when I talk about them, I can tear up because, you know, you go back and you revisit a patient from 40 years ago. It was emotional then, and it's still emotional now. But uh, I, it was just, a, it was a conscious effort to say, if this is going to be a good book that people really connect with, it's got to be real. It's got to be absolutely accurate. What happened? And just tell the story honestly. Just out of curiosity, did you journal throughout your career? Because the stories are told with, with accuracy and attention to detail. And it, it did have me wondering, but also I do understand how vividly we remember specific stories. And there are ones that stand out from the beginning of our training going ongoing from there. Yes, uh, I didn't write a single word while I was in practice. And I think that, you know, of course there's the, uh, you know, memory is a tricky thing and it, things do change. Uh, but these stories were all so powerful that, you know, I had locked them away in a little box. And I think all physicians have um, either really exciting or very rewarding or very painful experiences. And we put them away in a little box and then we go on with our busy lives. But that box is always there. And when I went back and opened it, uh, I just remembered things pretty vividly, hopefully very accurately. I certainly made an attempt to reproduce sentences and quotations the best I could. And we had a little book release party uh, last Saturday. And one of the, one of the uh, scrub texts was in two of the chapters and he came to the party uh, and I said, Paul, do you remember those events? And he said, I remember them exactly as you wrote them. So I think that they were so powerful that they were sort of indelibly etched in my mind. They feel accurate as, as you're reading them. And I love the way you describe being a medical student and the shift from being so elated to be, having been accepted to realizing the enormous responsibility that lies ahead. And that is, is a process. And I, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that process for you. For me, uh, I was so excited to get into medical school. Um, and I, I was a little bit, I think, like a lot of medical students, I'm a little puffed up, you know, I'm going to be a doctor and, you know, this is pretty cool. And 
uh, my, my very first test, written test in medical school was in uh, biochem. And I'll always remember it had a great big F on it. Now, a lot of the class failed that test. We had no idea we needed to learn it in that detail. Uh, and then in the first chapter, I talk about the first clinical test uh, being in our gross anatomy lab and the instructors telling us now treat these treat these cadavers with respect and with reverence you know they've made this incredible gift of their body and and I'm all I'm just jazzed up about man we're going to dissect this thing and and uh, didn't really show the proper reverence and respect that I should have so um, getting into med the process of being in medical school was uh, an enormous chopping me down to size. Um, and then I, I guess for the next uh, 40 years, building myself back up. And did you find the experience to be similar going into internship? I, I love some of the stories you tell about that leap of responsibility that happens from being a medical student to being an intern. And of course, that's just still the tip of the iceberg. In reality, my thinking on in retrospect on being an intern is that the biggest responsibility you have is to know your own limits and when to call for help, <laughs> Yes, which, uh, which the culture kind of makes you feel hesitant to do. And you, you describe a, a scenario there that relates to that. Yes. I, I was, I was, a, I did a surgery internship and, uh, and I think, you know, the, the surgery program, you know, that's got, those are the, the tough gals and the tough, to the tough guys, you know, it's not real touchy feely and uh, to call for help. That's sort of a, a sign of weakness. And uh, I just found myself with a, a patient who was dreadfully ill and, and um, I was just over my head and I, I just spun the wheels in my head for about 45 seconds and finally blurted out, <laughs> called Dr. Carter. And uh, it was a real learning experience that uh, a number of things. One, when when things look bad, they're bad until you prove that they aren't bad. Don't try to convince yourself that it's not quite as bad as it seems. Um, and second, that you have to be decisive. And if you can't be decisive in establishing a therapy, well, then you better be decisive in getting some help. Uh, and that chapter is called paralysis because I was paralyzed. And it could cost the patient their life. So uh, maybe we're, I, I know I went through my internship kind of scared to death, um, just feeling this overwhelming sense of responsibility. And, and I, I, I'm not sure I can handle this. Yeah, me too. And in fact, reading that chapter reminded me of a specific story when I was an intern toward the beginning of my year. And I got called in the middle of the night to see this patient, a cardiac patient, and I recognized the rhythm as needing to be shocked. The patient was conscious, mm -hmm. and I was also terrified of shocking him if he didn't need to be shocked, but, but it appeared that he did, and I was worried he may not make it until help arrived, which I did call for immediately, yeah. but I proceeded to go ahead and shock him, which was what I had learned I was supposed to do, although I had never done it and I had never even witnessed anyone do it. Yeah. And it worked. <laughs> and the cardiologist arrived and he looked at the EKG and he said, you did the right thing. But the patient, after the cardiologist left, the patient kind of pulled me close to him. And he said, by the way, because I told him, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm going to have to shock you. Someone's coming for help did my best to warn him. He pulled me close and he said, thank you for what you did. But also if you ever have to do that to someone again, give them pain medicine first. <laughs> but I'll bet that was an unbelievable learning experience for you and a huge step in your growth of being able to say, you know what, I have to do this. And then, I mean, that's, that's critical for a physician to be able to, to be able to make a decision and do it, even if it's even though it's totally out of their comfort zone. That is a big part of what we do: the learning to act, make a decision quickly, and act. And I think it influences everything else that we do to be Absolutely. able to make decisions. 
quickly when necessary. But also, I think one thing we work with physicians on and our, our coaching team often talks about is helping physicians to find places where they don't have to apply those skills in their lives. And I would love to hear about your experience in, in applying your or not applying your skills from medicine into your personal life. Um, well, I think one area of applying my skills that didn't involve my job was going on some mission trips. And um, I went on a number of Operation Smile trips and they do cleft lips and palates. And I remember going on one and coming back and one of my partners who was really kind of a mess and he was seeing the psychiatrist twice a week. And he said, David, that's the last thing I would want to do on a week's vacation. And I thought, Bob, that's the best thing you could do on a week's vacation because um, it, I just came back so energized and it was so rewarding. As one of my partners said in the Nashville airport, before we got on an airplane, we had done a number of trips together. He said, you know, David, it's an hour and a half of our life. It's the rest of their life. And when you can go do something like that with your skills, I mean, that's, that was one of the highlights of my entire medical career, being able to go on mission trips. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I did for um, uh, myself. Uh, I had a little rock and roll band for a while called the Painkillers that uh, was like an anesthesia band. And uh, that I certainly didn't use any medical skills with that. And I used what rudimentary guitar skills I had. Um, I, I found it was really important to have things outside of the operating room that would fulfill me. I was a board examiner for the American board for 20 years and um, ended up with a couple of inventions and that type of thing. I just, I just decided that if I only did what anesthesiologists do, uh, one, I wouldn't grow, and two, I'd be sort of in a rut. I think you've just touched on a key to preventing burnout is, is developing your life outside of work. So it's not work all the time and a narrow tunnel, a narrow tunnel of thinking and um, giving yourself that space to develop yourself as a person outside of work. Yeah. And you got to, I mean, you got to look and say, well, what do you think you might want to do? And you, you don't really know if you're going to enjoy it unless you jump into it. And um, so I jumped into a bunch of stuff. Fantastic. Would you describe your, how would you describe the process that you went through when you were choosing your specialty? Well, I chose it in an amazing manner. And I look back and I think, you know, well, you had a guardian angel. I, uh, I was really burned out in my surgery internship, I was uh, projected to go all the way through the cardiac program and become a cardiac surgeon. And late in my internship, I said, you know, I, I just don't think I, I just don't think I want to work that hard. Ironically, I ended up working awfully hard as an anesthesiologist, but the chief of anesthesia pulled me aside one day when I was working in the ICU, that rotation, he said, David, I understand you're thinking about leaving and going to ER medicine. And I said, yeah, I'm thinking about it. He said, well, come see me. And so I went and saw him and we talked for 30 minutes in his office. And he said, you really got to think about anesthesia. And I, to me, it was, it was a foreign graduate specialty that we, you know, they were just nameless, faceless across the ether screen. But I went and thought about it. And a week later, I went back to him and said, you know, Ballard, I think maybe I'd, maybe I'd like to do that. And he, and he said, well, I know people here, 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 here. And he said, well, how's San Diego? And uh, thinking the weather would be pretty good there. And he said, well, it's a top five program. They'll be filled, but I'll call. And then later that day, his secretary paged me. And she said, you're going to San Diego. So I chose my specialty based on a couple of 20-minute conversations and the fact that the average temperature in San Diego is about 70 degrees. Okay. Um, so interesting how people do choose their specialty and how it is so so 
impacted by fate. Yes, I, I was just unbelievable serendipity. Um, I mean, it, everything worked out so well, but I think back and think, you were such a flake. <laughs> You know, I've got a daughter that's a child psychiatrist and, and we plotted it all out. You know, here's where you're going to take a medical school rotation so that, you know, they'll want you as a resident and so forth. And I just, uh, I just stumbled my way through in my career. And it worked out so beautifully. Well, it is a lesson to all of us that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be all planned out in yeah. a detailed yeah, and, way. And one thing that as great as my career was, I found myself about three years into it in a group that was just a mess. It was a small group, we were fighting. I was terribly unhappy. You know, my wife said, you know what? It's the group or me. And I said, all right. You know, like the old Will Rogers thing, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And as hard as it was, to break up that group and leave. I said, you know what? I just have to do this. And uh, even though I've had this wonderful career, it was bumpy getting to most of it. You know, and I had a, a real painful period where I went through a few years in. So just encourage anybody listening to this. If they're in a bad situation, you're going to be practicing a long time. Uh, even if it means you have to change your job, go ahead and make that change. Wow, that is a that is a terrific quote from Will Rogers. I, yes. I could, I could uh, definitely use some, some reflection on that quote, especially retrospectively. It's interesting how often we stay committed to something that we committed to previously, when we're realizing that there may be better options. And if you find yourself in a practice like that, sometimes communication can help you to resolve issues that may seem insurmountable, but sometimes the best thing you can do is find another practice. And it sounds like that's what ultimately worked out very well in your Yeah, I mean, if there was a way we could salvage it, I mean, obviously if you can salvage it, it's so much easier and so much better. But if you can't, you just have to make that difficult decision. And I think it, maybe it's harder for physicians because, you know, we're so ingrained to, to get that goal. We've worked so hard. So you can't ever quit getting that goal. Well, you know, maybe there's another goal that it should be in its place. Maybe it's a, de a different position, a different career path, whatever it might be. Uh, right. Yeah. And it, it's an interesting statistic that 50% of physicians leave their first job within the first five years. That's huge. Wow. Yeah. So it, I'll, I'll bet it, I, I, I mean, I, I have to think it's getting worse. Because yes. when, when the dinosaurs like me started our jobs, I don't think there was a lot of bouncing around. I was unusual to be leaving a practice. I was huh. telling the other day, I said, you know, I think it was easier for me to work 12 hour days than it is for people to work eight hour days nowadays. I think the profession is much, much harder with all of the time constraints you've got to produce and the, the legalities, the electronic record, all the things that sort of separate you from a patient. Uh, I didn't have to deal with any of that. The practice has changed considerably. And I do think that we have to take that into consideration when we look at the increasing rates of burnout now, 63% reported, you know, back in November. Yeah. Um, I think the, pra the practice, the way we're practicing needs to, to change in as much as we have to recognize that people need development of their ability and the skill set to prioritize their own well-being. But also the, the systemic problems that we have where the volume has increased so much that we're having trouble staying tied to the purpose in the work that we do. And the work that you did and the, the book so well describes your ability to stay connected to that purpose throughout your career and how significant that was to making it a meaningful 
career for you. And so I would love to hear your advice if you have any for people who are practicing now or even medical students or even pre-med about ways to stay connected to that sense of purpose. Cause we all start out with that, with that need to care for other people and that intention, which ultimately can lead us into a path of self-neglect. That's really kind of the culture of what we learn during our training as medical students and residents. But how do you stay connected to that sense of purpose? I think part of it is your sort of outlook on taking care of patients. And I had a, uh, I had a, a really emotional experience I described in the introduction about the death of a burn patient and 19 years old, very tragic. What do you, what do you tell a family in that situation? Um, and the resident two years ahead of me was talking to the family. And the last thing he said to the family was, I want you to know it was a privilege to take care of your daughter. And that stayed with me the rest of my career. I get teary when I tell the story because I, I go back to that room. And I think part of it is realizing that what you're doing every day with this patient in front of you, this, this vulnerable person that's come to you, it's a privilege. You know, this is this honor that society has given us that allows us to take care of that person. I think the other mindset is to realize that you're there for the patient, not the other way around. And so that this is a, uh, um, I think that helps to get you into the human side of medicine. And I think trying to maintain that, that human bond with people, you know, the shared humanity, I would always, even as an anesthesiologist, we didn't have our patients awake real long, but I always tried to make it personal. Uh, always touch the patient when I listen to the chest. Always ask them something personal before we were done. Let them talk about themselves a little bit. And I benefited from that. You know, that it wasn't just a mechanical, let's get the next one done, but it's a real person here. And so I think any way that you can to keep this personal connection with your patients and um, this bond that is so unique in life that occurs between physicians and their patients. Beautifully said. I, I will quote you also on what you said a few minutes ago, which is be as real as you can be. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that's what we want from everyone else. So that's what our patients want from us. Absolutely. It is such a privilege to have you here on the podcast, Dr. David Alfrey, with your new book, Saving Grace, What Patients Teach Their Doctors About Life, Death, and the Balance in Between. Thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I think your podcast is absolutely fantastic and so needed. Thank you very much. We, we really appreciate it. And we will be sharing the book for anyone who's interested in reading it. And I do highly recommend it. I read a lot of books and interview a lot of people who've written tremendous books. And this is one of my new favorites. I'm going to be giving this as a gift to uh pre-med graduates who are going on to medical school. I think it would, will give them some food for thought and some insight into how to navigate the years ahead. But I thoroughly enjoyed it as, uh, as a practicing physician, because I do relate to the whole evolution that you describe in yourself as you became a practicing physician and the process, the learning process and the importance of staying connected to the purpose of the work that you're doing. And I look forward to future conversations with you. I'll come back anytime you want me. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks so much. As a practicing board certified physician, I know firsthand that time is our most precious commodity. I also know I wouldn't be where I am today without the support of coaching. At Doc Working, we can help. 
because we deliver meaningful, confidential, affordable, and scalable well being support. In order to do that, we've brought together a team of expert coaches and a 24 7 care line staffed by experienced therapists and counselors available around the clock. 365 days a year. We take pride in answering your calls with a person, not a recording. We provide success coaching designed to take minimal time, and we deliver it straight to your inbox every single week. This is not just for doctors. This is for everyone on your team. Having access to the Doc Working Thrive Wellbeing Portal is like a lifeline in your back pocket that you can call anytime, supporting you to chart the course to success and fulfillment on your own terms as only you can define for yourself. Our team is already helping over 80,000 healthcare professionals. We're here to help you and your team too. Please go to docworking.com and join our community today or click below in the show notes to join us. Thank you so much again for being here with us for Doc Working, the Whole Physician Podcast.